All right, as well as our clinical investigators, we're also proud of the fact that the Koch Institute produces trainees. Uh, who go out into the world and launch their own careers in cancer research. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Gabe Kwan, uh, who did his research in Sangeeta Bhatia's lab and has just moved to Georgia Tech. Uh, Gabe is an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech School of Engineering and at the Emory School of Medicine. Uh, and his, he conducted postdoc studies here at the Koch Institute of Sangeeta. His research program is conducted at the interface of the life sciences, medicine and engineering where a central focus is understanding how to harness the immune systems to eradicate disease and provide protective, protective immunity. Gabe has pioneered numerous biomedical technologies, including the first synthetic biomarkers capable of ultra-sensitive detection of cancer from urine, which you will hear about today. Concerned with global health challenges, he's also spearheaded the development of low-cost paper-based diagnostics uh, for use in resource-limited and urban-poor settings. So uh, we're very excited to hear about Gabe. Hello. Hi. It's really good to be back at MIT. Um, I really miss this place. and it's, it's actually only been about two months since I left <laughs> this very building. And as you can see, um, I'm very slow to remove my affiliations. So I figure what I do is I just add on to this um, and leave my MIT affiliation for a little longer. But um, I'm very excited to share with you some of the technologies that we've been developing here in this building uh, when I was a postdoc here with Dr. Bhatia. Um, which largely focuses on how we can develop nanotechnologies to better detect cancer uh, earlier with more sensitivity, with more specificity. And I think uh, Dr. Beer, as well as Peter, did a wonderful job um, painting the landscape of why this is important, especially for ovarian cancer. Now, um, ovarian cancer, there are a number of biomarkers that actually are already in use um, for, to manage uh, different types of uh, the, the progress of ovarian cancer. And one very well-known one is looking at gen hereditary genetic risks. So it turns out that if you, as women, if you harbor BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, um, you have anywhere from a 10 to 40% higher chance during the course of your lifetime of developing ovarian cancers as well as breast cancer. And so those patients oftentimes require more intensive surveillance as they get older um, in life. Now, of course, again, the major challenge in ovarian cancer is that at the time of diagnosis, only about 20% of cancers are diagnosed as stage one, where the cancer is confined to the primary site, to the, to the ovaries. And so this is very important because at this stage, in fact, that the five-year survival rate for these patients is reaching approximately 9%. So the, the goal here in early detection of cancer, especially for ovarian cancer, is if we can catch it earlier, we can potentially treat these um, and have a higher uh, career of potential for patients. And so the question, of course, is what makes early detection so challenging? And again, I won't um, um, belabor this point because of the wonderful job that Peter did um, really emphasizing the need for early detection. I'll just point out that there are a few methods that are used now or being investigated. One is the protein CA125. Uh, as, as Dr. Burr mentioned earlier, what we're actually doing now is we're doing serial measurements. And serial measurements, it turns out, to be a much better indicator of, of uh, when uh, tumor burden is coming up because we're looking at rates of change instead of absolute values of a protein bound marker. Um, so I think one question many people might want to know is why is it that biomarkers um, aren't sufficiently sensitive for early stage detection? So it turns out that it is uh, fundamentally limited by several problems, which is uh, limited by biology. So you can imagine if you have a tumor, um, it's growing at some expected rate. We can figure out what this rate is with good mathematical models. This tumor would be making a biomarker shedding at a certain rate that's going into the circulation. Now this production rate is limited by how quickly a cell can make stuff, okay? So it's limited by cellular machinery. Furthermore, as this protein biomarker enters into circulation, the first thing it experiences is now it's going from a very small tumor, potentially five millimeters, so if you want to think about early detection, to five liters of blood on average. And so there's a significant amount of dilution that already makes it substantially more challenging to detect at an earlier stage. And the third thing that happens is that these proteins, um, they actually are very quickly cleared from the circulation also, okay? So you can think of it like our blood pool, like a bathtub. We turn on the faucet, the tumor cells are creating this biomarker into the bathtub. 
But guess what? The bathtub is not is draining, and so the water is leaving this bathtub. And so this creates a problem if you want to create high levels of biomarkers in the blood. How do we do that? And so <clears throat> we've been thinking about this problem over the last couple of years intensively uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Sangita's lab and, and, and uh, the, the research who've been thinking about this particular area. And uh, oh, excuse me, so this kind of highlights exactly the problem that we're facing here with blood biomarkers is that if you consider all those rate constants I just told you about filling this bathtub with biomarkers, it turns out that it would take anywhere from zero, it would take from time of tumor genesis to detection eight to 10 years before we can fill this bathtub with enough biomarkers in order for us to detect using conventional technologies. So this is essentially where we are with um, a normal blood biomarker and their limitations. And so like I mentioned, what we've been thinking about is how do we improve on this process? And we thought, well, since a natural blood biomarker is limited, why don't we just make something that's synthetic so we can circumvent the limitations associated with biology? So it turns out that tumor cells, they produce a class of enzymes called proteases. Now proteases, the way that you can think about them, they are like molecular scissors, and their job is to degrade uh, proteins as well as tissue. And so, for example, um, there are a number of proteases in your stomach, which regularly degrades food products for digestion. But in the context of cancer, it turns out that these proteases are used to degrade the local tissue amongst other um, uh, jobs to, in order to create more space, if you will, for the tumors to grow, as well as to invade and metastasize or spread to other organs. And so recognizing this feature of cancers, we decided, well, wouldn't it be neat if we could design a nanoparticle, now uh, Sangita as well as um, um, you know, uh, Angie as well as others have talked about the advantage of nanoparticles where they can circulate in the body, they can actually localize the tumors. Wouldn't it be neat if we could design a nanoparticle that would be decorated with mimics of the surrounding tissue so that the proteases, when they're degrading the local tissue, they are also simultaneously degrading these products off of our nanoparticle, okay? And so therefore, we're actually generating a signal uh, by using the enzymes that the, the cancer cells themselves produce. And so what actually happens is that this nanoparticle, they're decorated by these protein mimics, they're called peptides, very, very short um, amino acid sequences. And when they're cleaved, these peptides enter into the blood circulation. And what ends up happening is because these fragments are very small, they're actually very rapidly filtered by the kidneys into the urine. And so what we actually have is a nanoparticle test where following administration, we're looking in the urine sample for a unique fragment that would tell us whether there are cancer cells in the body. Um, now this technique can be quite sensitive because there are two major modes of signal amplification. One is the fact that we're targeting proteases. Now proteases are what we call um, catalysts. And so catalysts, if you remember from um, chemistry, are substances that are not used up in a reaction. Okay, so when a protease cuts one copy of a protein or a tissue, it doesn't disappear. In fact, it can cut hundreds, if not thousands, of these uh, reporter molecules from the surface of the nanoparticles. So you can get one to many thousand fold amplification. And the second aspect that makes this platform potentially very sensitive is that we're not looking in the blood, which, like I mentioned before, these biomarkers would be diluted. But in fact, we're leveraging the fact that the kidney is like a filter, it's like a cheesecloth, so big things are retained in circulation while small things are filtered right through and can be concentrated into a very small void volume. So these two aspects um, uh, combined together makes this platform uh, uh, potentially very sensitive to detect early stage uh, cancers. And so this is essentially a quantification of that potential improvement. What you have here, this black line is a modeling of how much biomarkers can be produced in blood by a 100 milligram tumor, so it's not very much. We can look at how the nanoparticles can target a tumor, so we're looking at blood biomarker levels. So after injection, these nanoparticles, as they're accumulating into the tumor, they disappear from the circulation. But now if you look at the urine, you can see that given sufficient time, given sufficient protease activity, we can generate a signal that very quickly climbs and can surpass that of a traditional blood biomarker. And in fact, we've shown this in animal studies. And um, we did a number of studies um, looking at different types of cancers. Um, uh, we unfortunately didn't really look at ovarian cancer, but this is a model of colorectal cancer, but you can think of it as the same idea, where we can inject these fluorescent nanoparticles and look for the degradation products in the urine. And the take-home message I want you to, to leave here is that 
in the diseased animals, the animals that are bearing tumors, you can see the, the bladders lighting up. And this is evidence, direct evidence, showing you that these nanoparticles are being degraded and their degradation products are actually being concentrated into the urine. And it turns out that this technology is broadly applicable. There are many enzymes, there are many proteases, there are about 500 of them encoded by the genome. And so we can tweak these tissue samples, these, these nanoparticles to mimic different types of tissue samples um, where we can now design particles to sense liver disease, maybe even blood clots. In all instances, you can see the bladders lighting up, showing you the efficacy of this platform. Now lastly, uh, it's the last slide, I just want to show you um, the additional directions that Sangeeta is pursuing, as well as some ideas that I'm pursuing, but uh, largely Sangeeta's group. Uh, we're interested in looking at cancer metastasis, and this is particularly relevant for ovarian cancer because, as you know, 80% of patients, when they're diagnosed, actually have metastatic disease. And so we're trying to engineer these nanoparticles to sense proteases that are associated with metastasis. And the second area that we're really excited about is designing low-cost paper tests. So this is the same type of technology that you can go to your local supermarket and you can buy a home pregnancy test. You can pee on a stick, you know, indicate whether you are pregnant. Well, it turns out that we can redesign our formulation slightly such that we can now, instead of indicating cancer, be able to indicate potentially complex diseases such as cancer, um, such as liver fibrosis, thrombosis, and others. And because paper is such a wonderful material, it's ultra portable, it's ultra cheap, we envision that these could be shipped not just for in-home monitoring, but in global health applications where each test could cost literally 25 cents um, a test. So that I'll stop. And I do want to acknowledge a great, a fantastic group of MIT folks that I missed early. Um, <laughs> Uh, David Wood, who has gone on to the University of Minnesota as assistant professor. Kevin Lin, who's graduated from Sangita's lab, who's now in consulting. Andrew, a grad student, who, a talented grad student, who's um, working towards his PhD in Sangita's lab, as well as, obviously, Sangita for being such a wonderful mentor the past couple of years. Um, funding sources while I was here at the NIH through the NRSA, as well as the Burroughs Welcome Fund, and, of course, the Koch Institute. Thank you. Excellent. Questions? Yes, uh, we have one right here. Um, I have a question regarding to the um, extracellular protease. So uh, does normal tissue secrete uh, extracellular protease? Uh, if so, what's the background noise for, for your experiments? Yeah, so most of our background that we see actually is in circulating blood proteases. So normal proteases, we're, we're guessing that's associated with the coagulation cascade. There's also a complement cascade um, in, in immunity. And so we're, we're the second generation of this version is thinking about how we can redesign better peptides to suppress that background signal. Additional questions, we have one right here. Um, just wondering, like, since most of the particles are, have a high affinity to tissues like liver and spleen, instead of like peptide, do you have to function as any targeting moieties to let it go to like ovarian, which can be like very challenging to target too? Thank you. Yeah, so remember I'm, uh, I'm trained in St. Gideon's lab and half our lab does liver tissue engineering. So we like the liver. We like the fact that these nanoparticles go to the liver because for example, fibrosis, which is the uh, downstream result of alcohol abusers, um, untreated hepatitis patients, um, fatty liver disease, which is a big problem now, it affects over 500 million people uh, globally. And so we think that we could develop non-invasive sensors to monitor fibrosis that will be, have a high impact. And it turns out in the context of cancer, we're also very interested in looking at liver metastasis, um, which it turns out that for certain types of cancers, liver metastasis is also highly treatable. And so we're also looking at those applications for cancer. To, to what extent will uh, local inflammatory conditions create a foci of, of protease release and therefore confound your analysis of yeah, that's urine great, or, or blood? Yeah, that's a great insight. So that's why we like the idea of serial monitoring, that we can do multiple measurements over time, that in one instance we might see a slight increase because of inflama inflammatory associated proteases, but the idea is if we establish a baseline, multiple measurements, we should see a stronger inflection point when, when cancer will arise. So yeah, are there any final questions? If not, let's thank Wolf of Bar.